You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. You, you feel this this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. Well, I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You got to make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank caller. Prank caller. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Packernet After Dark Podcast. You know what it is. You know how we do. We're taking phone calls. That's it. That's the whole story. But anyways, let's uh, let's not waste any time. Let's get right into it. Uh, here we go. Hey, Ryan. This hey. is Blake, Dan. What's up, um, man? Let's just say Packers win the Super Bowl this year. Aaron Rodgers retires. How does it sound to have... In 2023, Jordan Love at quarterback, and then our top three receivers are Watson, Dobbs, and Rod, Amari Rodgers in the slot. That'd be a little bit interesting, and it'd be a heck of a big difference. Um, what do you think about that? Later. Um, well, I, I, I would take it to some degree as a good sign because I don't think it's – necessary that that would have to be the case unless they felt confident enough in it. I mean, with Jordan Love, okay, fine. I mean, there's not a lot of options. And even if we draft somebody because we're not confident, Love is probably going to get the start there. Um, but at wide receiver, they would certainly do something unless they're incredibly confident. Free agent wide receivers, drafting wide receivers, something. So if we decided not to bring back Lazard, we decided not to bring back uh, Watkins, we decided not to bring back Randall Cobb, and we didn't really draft anybody that's prominent. We decided not to bring in any other additional free agents. It just gives me the impression that they are uh, somewhat confident in these guys' abilities. Now, sitting here today, does that make me nervous? Of course it does. But new era is coming, and what that looks like is so far beyond my comprehension, I can't even explain it. I mean, think about it. If and when Aaron Rodgers leaves, and let's say it's next year, we are a team that is uh, has a really good offensive line, running backs, and defense. This is like... This is some old school football, man. It's the opposite of everything the Packers have ever been, with the exception of the offensive line, which, you know, that, that carries over. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's scary, but who knows? Hello, this is JJ. That's my voice for today. All right. Uh, seafood. I feel like I haven't heard you talk about seafood very much. Uh, can you give me your thoughts on if you like it? And uh, what are good or bad seafoods if you are into it? Uh, I'm a big seafood geek. I used to work at a, a fish market. Actually, that was my first job out of school at a butcher shop. It was a lot of fun. Got to try a bunch of different fish. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of a fan, but I know you're a bit of a picky eater. But it's also meat. So let me know what you think. Yeah, so... Um... I'm assuming that was you mocking the uh, impressions and stuff because obviously JJ would never call in and try to make some kind of noises or sound effects or impressions or anything. But um, I'm very... Seafood can be great, but it's one of those things that, as a general rule, it kind of grosses me out. So it's got to be real good because if it's done wrong, it sucks so hard. You know, it's one of the things I've always said I liked about pork is it's kind of hard to mess up. I've had some terrible ribs, and they are like still top 10 food of all time. Bad ribs are amazing. Bad burgers are edible sometimes, usually. Bad fish, though? Ugh. For example, salmon. A good salmon is one of my favorite things in the world. Just, it's, it's one of my absolute favorites. But like cold salmon, to me, is kind of gross. I don't like it. I don't want it. I'm not eating it. I see a big salmon just laid out cold. Like, what am I... But it's like, oh, it's chilled, and you put it on a cracker or something. Uh, that's all right. I'm going to pass. Shrimp, same thing. A good pasta dish, hot pasta dish with some shrimp, dude. You get, like, that combo. I've had some, I don't know what you call it, but it's got, like, chicken 
and shrimp and some stuff and even like the bell peppers which i just pick out but so good it's like spicy and it's amazing but just like eating cold shrimp i'm not doing it and there's other kinds of shrimp that are not great um so it just it just depends you know fish fry super hit or miss some of the best food i've ever had are fish fries but also it can be kind of eh, not very good so it it's not forgiving i guess is the way that i would put it, it it's got to be done a certain way or it's just going to be kind of gross um, I, I remember my stepmom once actually made scallop spaghetti. I've never had scallops in my life. And I'm like, this is gross. Can we just put meatballs in here? And I ate it and it was amazing. I thought it was the best thing ever. And then I tried to make scallops myself and it was so disgusting. So I, I messed it up somehow. I don't know. I'm not sure what the deal. I tried to do it like Gordon Ramsay style, how he says to do it. And it just ruined everything. One thing that, I, that always annoys me about like Gordon Ramsay is everything has to be blaring high heat. But I think we have two different definitions of what high heat is. Because when I do high heat, I'm talking cranking that burner as high as it can possibly go. And anything I put in there burns in 0.4 seconds. It doesn't matter if it's oil, butter, salt-free butter, meat. The second it touches the pan, it's burnt. And he's, he's over there like, oh, he's got butter. And he's it's like, oh, it's got to be super hot. And you put the steak in the pan and you're scooping the butter. There's no scooping butter. Within four seconds, my burnt butter is setting off fire alarms. So, you know, don't lie to me. And by the way, it, with all these recipes, can you just tell me what you want me to do with this burner? It'll be like, oh yeah, boil water and then like turn it down. Turn it down to what? I had it on high, which is like the 10th notch. Should I put it down to eight? Should I put it down to medium? Should I put it down to low? Should I put it all the way down to actual low where it's like ba- barely even? What are you talking? Can you just tell me what to do? Turn it on medium high. What's medium high? Like, should I just put it in between medium and high and just assume that's fine? Like what? Give me... A freaking answer. By the way, I actually got one of those little guns that tells you the temperature, and I, I can tell you definitively that all the way high is never necessary. Like for searing or whatever, you know, you're looking, I don't know, 500 degrees is fine. Dude, you can get that with like medium heat. <laughs> These pans get hot. I mean, if, if I'm baking something, they'll be like, put it at 372 degrees for exactly 14.375 minutes. But if you're just using the stove top, I don't know, medium high-ish, crank it down a little bit, and then turn it up a little bit, kind of a lot of bit, but a little bit. There's notches. Count out the frickin' notches for me, can you please? Like, put it on the fourth notch, let it sit there, then crank it up to medium high, which is the seventh notch or whatever. Can I don't understand. Every recipe in the world, it seems like, is just winging it. That's why I like, you know, baking and barbecue. It's, it's very specific. It drives me nuts. Frickin' Ramsey jerk all the way up crank it as high as it can possibly go you can't go too high the second you put butter in there it just turns black you freaking liar everything's ruined what are you burning in there listen don't give me the attitude it was that jerk off on tv that doesn't know how to run businesses kitchen nightmares do you know all those things go out of business immediately after it's because he probably went in there and burned all our food i think he's just lying though he doesn't want people to cook good food like he does he knows it's supposed to be like the sixth notch. But no, he tells you as high as it'll possibly go. Okay, show me your stove. Show me it. Prove it. Prove that you have this thing up all the way. I don't want to see your cut up version of this. Show me the whole process. I want to see your 900 degree pan searing off meat and your butter just staying a nice golden brown for five minutes while you baste your steak. Give me a break, you hack. But yeah, seafood's pretty good. Uh, Dennis, what's going on, man? Ryan, Dennis from Detroit. Hey, uh, good information on the uh, sous vide the other day. That was an excellent synopsis. Oh, yeah. Um, it wasn't until I got into this stuff that I really understood what cooking was all about because, like you mentioned, you can do a lower temp, not cook everything to 165 to kill all the critters, uh, but still cook stuff because of pasteurization. Right. What we're really doing is pasteurizing the meat so that it's safe to eat. And then it just, once you understand that, it, it's, it's pretty amazing. And it's and it's great because I and I understand people freak out, especially with chicken. It's the same with pork. Everybody hated pork because pork used to be one sixty five, and at one sixty five, pork tastes like garbage. But now that you can cook it to one forty five, like Blaine and I are on a crusade to convince people that pork is one of the best things in the world because they've never had a juicy, succulent pork chop cut, cooked to one hundred and forty five degrees before. Same is true with chicken, though. It really is. If you cook chicken to one forty five. I know that's going to freak people out and be like, that's gross. And to be honest, the first time I made 
chicken sous vide, and I, I, it was probably even below 145. I don't know what recipe I was. I didn't even know about what cooking temperatures were, so I didn't know enough to be freaked out by it. I took it out of the bag, and I was so angry because I'm used to chicken when it's done. It should be rock hard. Like you, you pick it up and you can hold it, and there's no bend to it at all. I pulled this chicken out of it out of the sous vide bag, and it was flopping as though it was raw. And I was so mad. I put it back in another bag, kept cooking it. It stayed that way. And so I was like, "What the heck is going on?" So I, you know, you can see it's like white colored on the outside. Sous vide makes food looks gr- look gross, but it tastes good. I cut into it, and it's the same color all the way through. And I'm like, "Okay, I guess it's cooked, but it's floppy. It's that soft." And it's still full of juice, but it's cooked. It's incredible. So, yes, it's a great, it's a great thing. I would encourage anyone that's interested in this to look up the chart. I'm sorry, the images on Google Images. Look at like red meat and how you get edge to edge, you know, perfect color. Then you sear it it's, it's with a crust. It's amazing. And then uh, if you're into eggs, like poached or any which way from runny to absolutely you know, light yellow, hard boiled. Sous vide does it perfectly. Uh, there's a chart I like that's 45 minutes. And then based on whatever degrees, right, it cooks it to that perfectly every time. That is the best thing about sous vide. It, it, it does things perfectly. It's The problem with cooking is it's all about like timing. And if things are off just a little bit, everything's ruined. And even if you time it perfectly, you can never do it as well as sous vide can. You just can't. Because, you know, when, when you put something and you're smoking it, even at a, let's say a low temperature of 200 and 200 degrees, right? You're, you're smoking it. The idea of doing it low is that you're not cooking the outside so fast and then the inside isn't getting done yet. It should be a slow cook because what you're really doing is cooking the outside of the meat. And then the outside of the meat is cooking the sort of inside of the meat. And the sort of inside of the meat is cooking the inside of the meat, which is cooking the, you know, it's just, it's a slow thing where each layer cooks the next layer over. And so, the first, the outside of the meat has been cooked this whole time and it's starting to turn from, you know, red to pink to brown to dark brown to blackish. And you have to keep it on there because it needs to penetrate all the way to the inside. But with sous vide, you put it at the temperature you want it to be and it cooks it at that perfect temperature from edge to edge. And it's just the very, 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 very outside that has any color whatsoever. And I think it's because it's actually making physical contact with the bag, which is at a, you know, the, it's the same temperature, but it's a different kind of heat. It's not like the radiant or whatever. It's the contact. I don't remember the, the names of it, but it's a different kind of heat because it's physically touching it. I think. I don't know. But there is no way to cook a steak more perfectly than sous vide. There just isn't. If you want just, you know, a seared steak that is perfectly medium rare from all the way on the edge to all the way on the edge with no gradient color whatsoever, sous vide is really the only way to do that. You can get it close. You cannot get it perfect anyway, and it's the same with everything else. Same with eggs. You don't really have to time it. You set it to the well. I, it's not true. You do have to time it with eggs, especially. But yeah, it's 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 so exact. That's the whole point. You set it to an exact temperature. I haven't done eggs, but I know it. Uh, I know it does an incredible job with that. Eggs are already in the perfect packaging. Naturally, you just drop them in there. It's uh, it's amazing. I'll cook a bunch, and then I zap them you know, in the microwave for like 10 seconds, 15 seconds later on, and it just heats up wonderfully. It's it's magic. Um, but enough about that. So my, today my question is, in the last year I've been listening, I know you said you're a federal employee, you work at a hospital, you work with doctors, all this stuff. I have never really put together what exactly it is that you do. I'm kind of interested in this because this week, uh, my company, you may have heard, is in the news uh, for whacking 2,000 salaried and 1,000 uh, contract people, which I'm hoping they just did the other day on Monday because uh, we're all walking around the plant here waiting for the other shoe to drop, thinking we might be booted this week too. But uh, if you would, for the youngsters that might be listening, interested in sous vide and maybe what they want to do with their lives, uh, my industry is fraught with you know, you make good money, but then every, you know, four or five years, there's this big upheaval and, you know, a bunch of people get whacked. Uh, what's it been like for you? What the first? What's your job? And what would you tell the kids, you know, when they're setting out in life? Uh, I'd really like to hear that. I'll catch you later, Bob. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I know there's one listener that, that knows what I do because they're also a federal employee and looked me up and they, they were able to figure it out. I don't know why, but I think I'm going to keep that a mystery. But I will say this. 
a hospital in general is a good job working at a hospital. I'm not saying you can't get fired. Obviously, COVID was a crazy thing where things happened, but you're never going to run out of sick people. With that said, I, I don't know. I mean, you got to take, no matter what, there's, there's bad advice depending on if you take it to the extreme. You need to learn what it is you're good at, which is hard to do because I didn't really figure that out until I was like 30, and I can't suggest that you don't figure it out, um, you know, don't do anything until you're 30. But also, following your passion is also kind of stupid. You need a job that makes money. And so, for example, don't spend like $80,000 getting a degree that's going to make you $50,000 a year when you can go to a, you know, technical college pay for that while you're going to school because it's so cheap, and then come out making, I don't know, 50, 60. Be smart about it. Find a good job, a good career path. Again, hospital is just one thing because, again, it's not going to go out of business. But there's a lot of stuff. I don't know, man. Just don't do stupid things. There's a lot of different things you can do and make a good job out of it. Just don't do stupid stuff. hear people talking about having like a doctorate degree in preschool education. Well, what did you do that for? I can't believe I'm not making enough money to justify. Well, duh, why did you get a doctorate? Why didn't you think that through? So, I don't know, find out what jobs are out there. Go get a job. But I would start with, like, what jobs you can get with no schooling, what jobs you can get with two-year schools, and if you're going to go to a 40-year or postgraduate type stuff, it better beat out those other ones. Otherwise, what the heck are you doing? Just initial thoughts. Hey, this is JJ. I'm not going to do an accent, because that would be yeah, um, obviously. I... Hello, this is JJ. That's my voice for today. <laughs> okay, what are you saying, JJ? Hey, this is JJ. I'm not going to do an accent. Cause that, would be stupid. that would be dumb. Um, but I have a gripe. It's not a gripe with the show. It's a gripe with my real life. And I don't know. Maybe you got some perspective. Oh, boy. Maybe I'm already making the best of this that I can. I don't know, but I live in a small town in Michigan, mm-hmm. and a lot of restaurants have gone out of business here Uh-oh. in the last few years, really since since COVID happened, <clears throat> and there's just nowhere to eat anymore, and they keep all the former restaurants, Yeah, they keep, you know, one will close, and I'm like, ah, I really like that restaurant anyways, maybe we'll get a a better restaurant will move in. No, it's a weed shop every single time. <laughs> I think we have 12 weed shops. I've never seen a weed shop in my life, but all right. In my little town now. And it's a sign of a great community. When the community at large is like, we don't want food, we want pot. Right? It's like... <laughs> and you can't say it's not the community because, you know... Capitalism, man. If people wanted pizza, somebody would open a pizza shop. But no, they want a sixth pot shop. I don't have a problem with it, but I don't really partake. It's just not my thing. So, you know, the the fast food restaurants that are in town are jacking their prices up. And all the, like, nice sit-down places are all gone. So... My reaction has just been to cook at home all the time and, you know, try to learn new recipes at home and um, experiment with different types of cuisine at home. So that's where I'm at. Uh, Still feeling a little frustrated. And I I just think it it just kind of stinks for those of us who like food, you know, hooray for the people who are excited about all the weed shops, but some of us just like to eat. Um, yeah, that, that sounds like it's, uh, that kind of sucks. I gotta be honest though. I'm, I'm stunned at the amount of people that like, they just eat out. That's just what they do. I listened to, um, I already griped about Gordon Ramsay. Let's talk about Dave Ramsey. The amount of people on there that are just like, I don't know, I go out to eat every day. Like breakfast is like the drive through. And then for dinner we go out to eat and I go to a restaurant like three times a year. Like. <laughs> It might be a slight under exact, but like a nice place. I don't remember the last time I went to a restaurant. Usually if we go, like, I think we're going to go tomorrow because it's my son's birthday and he wants to go to a restaurant. We don't go out to eat. It's just not a thing we do. We, first of all, we've been poor our entire marriage, so we can't afford to go out to eat. Now, even that we have money, it's like, I don't know. 
It's just an extremely special thing that you don't... Plus, when you got a bunch of kids, it's a hassle. So it's just weird to hear people like, oh, man, now I got to eat at home. Like, I have to learn how to cook. <laughs> what have you been doing this whole time? I just, I can't wrap my head around it. I've never experienced that. When I was a kid, eating out was special. Live with my grandparents. I mean, it was a little bit more, but it's like, well, grandma's rich. So, you know, she stops and gets us cops and stuff, you know, once a week, which is basically all the time. And Crossroads pizza and stuff, which is amazing. But yeah, I, I don't, um, it sucks about the restaurants. That is true. And I don't think I'd want to live <clears throat> in a community that, you know, is just tons of pot shops. We can talk all we want about, oh, no, it's safe and all that. I don't care that it's safe. It's still just decay. It wouldn't be any different if it was a bar or liquor stores or whatever. It's just the decay of a town. So that sucks either way. Act like people are smoking weed to become enriched. <laughs> that's, that's what ambitious people do. I don't want to hear. I had to listen to that when I was in middle school for nonstop. I'm smarter when I smoke. I'm faster when I smoke. I'm more generous when I smoke. Okay, you, you're superhuman when you shut your brain off. Got it. As if I haven't walked into rooms and seen you guys just sitting around like zombies eating potato chips staring at a wall. Oh yeah, bunch of Einsteins over here. But yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I will say that was kind of a big thing for me with the whole barbecue was realizing, because I, I always ate at home, but it was just cheap stuff. Like I didn't buy meat because I couldn't afford it. So I bought bread, like the 99 cent loaves of bread, and I made sandwiches and made ramen and stuff like that. And, you know, that was about it. Occasionally I'd splurge and like some chicken back when chicken was affordable. Now chicken for some reason is like basically steak. But the light bulb went off and I realized I can actually make restaurant quality food. Might mess it up once in a while. But if I follow simple recipes, which YouTube is just like, hey, you want to see how to make like the best pasta dish in the world? You just do this. Remember I made like homemade pizza sauce and it was like, this is freaking amazing. I butchered the dough, so the pizza kind of sucked a little bit. I mean, it wasn't bad, but the sauce was unbelievable. And it was the easiest thing. It's like you, you, we like hand crush the tomatoes, you know, which was fun. Couple little things, basil leaf, let it kind of simmer for a while. Amazing. You know what I want to do too sometime, which I've never done? I want to make pasta, because why not? But yeah, man, I think, the, I think that's what you got to do. Go on YouTube. Just find like your favorite dish. That's what you should do. Find your favorite dish in the world. Whether it's at one of your favorite restaurants that's not there anymore or just something that's even better. If you could fly anywhere in the world, I would go to this restaurant. I would get this meal. And then just go on YouTube and find a recipe for it and make it at home. Get all the high quality ingredients and stuff. It's still going to be half the price of what you'd pay in a restaurant. I'm getting myself excited to do it now. All right. Uh, do 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 Not a ton of calls, so I'm just going to... We'll do a break here. It's also getting kind of late, and I want to get this podcast up. So we'll take a break. Uh, 608-501-0718 if you want to call in. Take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the icon of vacations. Icon of the Seas, arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry Bahamas. Taste the Mediterranean through March 19th at Whole Foods Market. Save on Animal Welfare Certified bone and Beef Short Ribs, Sustainable Wild-Caught Sockeye Salmon, and more. Find sales on Parmigiano-Reggiano. 
charcuterie and ground lamb, grab an olive boule bread from the bakery, plus wines from the Mediterranean start at just $8.99. Taste the Mediterranean now at Whole Foods Market. Must be 21 plus. Please drink responsibly. Hey, Pac Daddy. I uh, just wanted to call in and say that I think we really need a Bears hate episode mm. or a laughing at the enemy for the Bears. Mm. They're getting awfully chirpy on they Twitter are. right now. I just got in an argument with a, cu- a few before who claimed that Jair is not an elite corner. Um, they were saying that he's always injured, which I don't <laughs> think that is accurate. Either, mm, no. but, you know, just last One season injury. he was injured. So I don't know where they're going with that. And they're also claiming that Mooney is an elite Oh, I've seen receiver. that. So they're oh. just saying all kinds of crazy stuff. And I think that you need to put them in their place. Go back, go. Well, I mean, you know, the only reason that I don't have a third podcast, one Packernet in the morning, one Packernet after dark, and then an afternoon show called I Freaking Hate the Bears Because They Suck and Here Are 50 Reasons Why, um, it's just because people don't want to hear it. I mean, you do, I would, a couple other people would, but, um, you know, I, I just, I, I, I literally get complaints about it, which is, always surprises me when people are, oh, stop talking about the bears. Like, I'm not like praising them or just being like, well, let's look at their 53 man roster. I'm just saying they suck for like 40 minutes straight. Um, but yeah, people complain about it. So, um, but you know, I'm always down. I just don't, I don't have a ton to work with because it's preseason, right? I'll throw little jabs at them and then they freak out because it's preseason, but I still laugh because, I mean, they're going to overreact to preseason anyways, but either way, it doesn't matter. You say stupid stuff, you let them overreact and then you just laugh and you just keep poking them and they just, they flip out. Um, but yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm very excited. Um, there have been some times when laughing at the enemy would really take off, but like you said, the reason they're getting chirpy is because they're getting confident. Um, they really are excited about Justin Fields. They're really excited about Darnell Mooney. They think their offensive line is completely fixed. They think they've got a top 10 defense. Um, they think they've got a top 10, 15 running back. And um, nothing's really going to knock them off that pedestal right now. So we just got to wait until the regular season. And then even then, when they get spanked by the 49ers, uh, even though Trey Lance throws three interceptions, they still are going to lose by like four at least. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll do a laughing at the enemy and chirp at them and laugh at them and everything. And then they'll say, oh, it's just week one. <laughs> but, you know, we'll see how it goes, man. We'll see how it goes. But I get it. They're, they're, they're out of control. Here's the thing I just keep coming back to with the Bears and the Bears fans. Like I said, they, they believe they have a franchise quarterback. They, they really believe Justin Fields is a great quarterback. They genuinely believe they have a competent offensive line, good offensive line. They think Mooney is a top 10 wide receiver. They think um, what's his nuts is a top 10 running back. And they believe they have a top 10 defense. By the way, Cole Komet is about to break out as a tight end. But you can't get them to commit to more than six wins. Explain that to me. Show me a team that is a top 10 defense, a top 10 quarterback, a top 10 offensive line, a top 10 wide receiver, a top 10 tight end, a top 10 running back, but can't win seven games in a season. Doesn't exist. Explain that to me. Because that's what they'll always say. Well, I'm not saying they're going to be a good team. I'm just saying you can't. You're overreacting and saying we don't have a, a good offensive line, and we do. Saying we don't have a good defense, and we do. You show me that team, because what you're describing is an 11-12 win team, but what you're saying is going to happen is six wins. So you tell me where the deficit is. You show me why this team can't win seven games. Explain it to me. They can't. So play with them a little bit. See if you can catch them in that one, because that's always kind of fun. All right, all right. I swear this is my last call. JJ. I'm responding to caller number five, who thought that I was taking a shot at him for his voices. I need to set the record straight. Um, I really like Well Done Accents, and man, you kill it. Great. What I don't like is impressions of specific people, all right? When someone's like, hey, you got to hear this Donald Trump impression. It's spot on. I'm like, no, it's not. It's terrible. Christopher Walken, you know, uh, Morgan Freeman. Really good ones are good, though. I like really good ones. They all just, they stink. So your accents are fantastic. It's when people try and do impressions of celebrities. That's that's what's awful. There is a, forget who the guy is. He, He does an Arnold Schwarzenegger. There's, you know what's really bad, though? There's, there's one guy who, like, <laughs> it's, it's kind of cringy. 
I can't remember his name. Let me find him real quick. I feel bad picking on the guy because it's his whole life, but... Oh, I know his name. It's Jim Meskimen. And I'm not, I'm not saying he's he's not that bad. And if, if you go watch him, you're going to be like, this guy's actually good. What are you talking about? If you look at like really good impressions of any one person, Jim Meskimen is not the best at anyone. He's probably not even top 10 at anyone. He's he's decent at some, but like he he considers himself like the greatest impressionist of all time. And he just does this really cringy stuff. I don't know. It's just, uh, it's not my favorite, but like, for example, here's him doing Christopher Walken. And I, I do Christopher Walken. It's not even this good. It's really bad. That's why I do it alone in my car and nobody else can hear it. But for a professional whatever, come on, man. Christopher Walken has to be the most imitated man on the planet. It's like a disease. It's not good. It's just not good. He actually refers to himself as Master Impressionist. Is that's I think that's what annoys me more than anything. He's not bad. It's just you should be better if you're going to call yourself the Master Impressionist. I'm also annoyed that every time I try to find something on YouTube, it's taken over by AGT, and these are not the best people at almost anything. I watch AGT with my wife. It's it's a good show, but like the comedians are not funny. The Impressionists are. Meh. Maybe that's what JJ is watching. Is America's Got Talent? And he's like, I hate Impressionists. No, it's just AGT has trash talent. You know how I really like, though, is Joe Gaudette, another one. His Arnold Schwarzenegger impression, it freaks me out. Well, listen, Brian, I think you know who this is, all right? This is very important, all right? So listen to me. If you're not here on Thursday, it's hasta la vista, baby. With some- That's good, man. That dude's good. Anyways, what else we got going on here? Let's get back to Nate. Hey, back daddy, Nate calling in again. Uh, just wanted to throw a little something out there because I know there's some Bears fans who were considering calling in with trash talk today. Do the Bears have a top five player at any position on their team? Any at all? Uh, I, I'll even take a, a top ten. Are there any top ten players at any position? Uh, legit question and also a little bit of shade thrown at them. Go back, go. I'm... 99% sure there's no top five player. I'd have to look at their special teams. Um, top 10, I don't think so. But let's take a little look-see. I don't think they would even debate that they have a top 10 offensive lineman. I think they'd be out of their minds if they said Fields was. The only players on offense that they might argue would be Mooney, Montgomery, and Komet. And I know... Nobody that's not a Bears fan would look at Komet as being anything relevant whatsoever. But you got to remember, they're convinced that everything is bad just because of their head coach, and with this new scheme, everybody's going to be amazing, right? Well, they didn't throw to Komet in the red zone because they were obsessed with Jimmy Graham in the red zone. Okay, whatever. Anyways, last year, via PFF, Montgomery, their elite running back, ranked 28th. Mooney, their elite wide receiver, ranked 33rd. Komet, their elite tight end, ranked 37th. Technically, the highest um, player was their quarterback in terms of rank, or I should say closest to being top 10, and that's Fields at 29th, but that's just because there's like 30 quarterbacks, 35-ish. But um, yeah, on defense, I know for a fact several would say Jalen Johnson is a top 10 player. Um, He ranked 50th last year. Um, Roquan, I'm, I know for a fact, probably at least 50% of uh, Bears fans would say he's top 10. I mean, it, it's it's not even debatable. PFF has him ranked 62nd. They hate him because he's a putrid run defender, like horrific. He did almost rank top 10 in coverage, though, so that's great. Um, 12th would be his rank. I don't think anyone actually thinks Eddie Jackson is a good safety anymore. I think Bears fans, they did. Like, if you tried to trash Eddie Jackson in 2019 or even in 2020, they'd be like, you're an idiot. You don't know football. And then by 2021, they're like, all right, fine, he sucks. I I, I see that now. Um, Quinn had a lot of sacks. He ranked 34th. Gibson ranked 33rd, actually better than Quinn, which is going to drive them nuts because, you know, whatever. But um, I don't think anyone's... Close. I mean, the highest rank of any player on the entire team is Justin Fields, who's 29th, because he's a quarterback and there's none of them. If you don't look at Justin Fields, the highest ranked player anywhere is Montgomery, who ranks 28th. Kind of a similar situation with running backs, but whatever. You can hardly find... Listen, 
you should have a top 32 player at every position. That just means you have a number one somewhere. They don't have a top 32 wide receiver. They have top 32 quarterback and running back because there's not a whole lot of other people, but um, 28th and 29th. They don't have a top 32 pass rusher. They don't have a top 32 defensive tackle. They don't have a top 32 cornerback. They don't have a top 32 linebacker. They don't have a top 32 safety. Top 32, which is one, just, just, just one of the top amongst the 32 teams. You have a guy before somebody else has their second guy, right? The Bears don't really have that. So, I mean, we, yeah, clearly they could say, well, that's going to be, well, the first thing they'd say is PFF is stupid, right? Which that only applies when PFF doesn't like them, which is always, which is why Bears fans universally hate PFF, because PFF doesn't like any of their players. But here's, here's, here's something to, to chew on a little bit. You think you have good players. PFF doesn't think you have good players. Your team doesn't win football games. I wonder who's more correct about this. I don't know. We'll have to have to chew on that for a little bit. Because to be clear, they loved a lot of your players in 2018. And that's when you won games. And then when you stopped winning games, suddenly they looked at it and they said, well, I think we got a problem here. Some of your players suck. And you're like, no, they don't. They're great. <laughs> okay. Your team sucks now. So that's weird that they're still great. Just accept your players are not good. There's a reason why Vegas thinks you're going to win three games this year. And it's not because you have a bunch of top 10 players. It's not because Fields and Mooney and Montgomery and Komet and Johnson and Quinn and Roquan are a bunch of top 10 players and Gordon and Brisker are going to be elite players. And Tevin Jenkins in your offensive line is massively improved now. It's none of those things. Not one of those things. I shouldn't say not one. I'll grant you maybe one of those things happened, but I don't know which. I really don't. I would be surprised if it's Mooney because, you know, with the offensive line and quarterback play and everything, it's unlikely. And Fields' quarterback play improving is unlikely because of the offensive line, wide receivers, and whatnot. Running back isn't going to do anything because, you know, the offensive line. So, you know, but maybe, but probably not. So best of luck, guys. Hey, Ryan, this is Dan Dubois. Hey, Dan. Uh, no, it's not another tipping question. Oh, good. But, um, talking with my pops about the defensive team between uh, Barry and Evan, and it's more so with the defensive line. So we've all seen kind of like a, I wouldn't say necessarily a drop-off with, plenty, with Kenny Clark, but um, since Joe, uh, with Mike Pettin, his big focus was on the, the defensive line and bolstering that making the defensive line look really good whereas Joe Barry's defense is more focused on the linebackers so with Mike Petton we saw that Blake Martinez he was just there for cleanup and he was essentially just a role to help support the defensive line whereas I am seeing with Joe Barry's defense it's more of that emphasis on the linebackers and maybe the defensive line is just more so to hold their own to hold their position so the linebackers have these big holes and these big opportunities to make the play. Um, yeah, this one's going to have to take a little bit of research and looking into, but just wanted to throw it out there and see what your thoughts are on that. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye. Um, so I, I, I don't know scheming stuff enough to really elaborate on that. Um, I'm sure if I agree or disagree with you, I'm going to be wrong. I certainly can't reduce it to that level. I know I've said several times Mike Pettin was obsessed with the defensive line, not necessarily because I f really understand his scheme, but just because you could tell based on his priorities, right? With free agents and everything else, it was all about that defensive front, especially defensive tackles. And yeah, things like linebacker got neglected and linebackers tended to be bad, right? Under um, Dom, I think Martinez did well and then Pettin came in and Martinez was not good. And then Martinez went to the Giants and he had a resurgence in his career. And then Joe Barry comes in and the linebackers do a really good job and all that. So um, I, I don't know. I mean, I've heard, I, I know Joe Barry would be uh, offended, as would Petten by the characterization, because I don't think they would put it that way. But there's certainly more of an emphasis on linebacker than we've had by just about anybody so far. But it sounds like you're asking specifically about Kenny Clark, and maybe Joe Barry is kind of the reason Kenny Clark is not jumping off the page. Here's the thing with Kenny Clark, though. Let me just read you his defensive grades. This is something that nobody's going to want to hear or listen to or whatever, but 
It just is what it is, all right? Let me just read it to you. Not that it's ever been bad, but you remember how I've mentioned that sometimes guys have like this one-off spike and then it kind of levels off? Here's Kenny Clark's grades, 75, 87, 90, 79, 76, 75. He had elite years in 2017 and 2018, and that's it. The other four years of his career have been mid-70s. He's never had a 10-sack season. The one year he had nine, which was his closest, he also had significantly more opportunities than a lot of the other years. That was his most pass rush attempts, you know, of his career. This past year, he had a pressure percentage of 12.4%. Now, you might have heard me say that he's not doing so great or whatever. He's not as what. That is his highest percentage ever. So I don't want to give the impression like Kenny Clark has been elite for like five straight years. And then Joe Barry comes in and his grade fall off, grades fall off, and his pressures dropped to 12% when it used to be like 15%. That's not the case. Like two to three years, he's been sub 10%. His sack numbers are 0, 5, 6, 9, 5, and 4. His run defense grades the last three years have been above a 70 once. His tackling grades the last three years, 48, 46, and 36. He missed 18% of his tackle attempts this past year. So, listen, I'm, I'm not sitting here saying the guy is straight garbage or whatever, but I am saying that, in, in my opinion, he's overhyped when he's considered a you know top five defensive tackle in the league. Maybe he's top 10. I don't know. I'm not going to do the work to discredit Packer fans calling him top, top 10 because that seems counterproductive. But let's just say I wouldn't be shocked to find out he's not. As a pass rusher this past year, he was within the top 10, ninth as far as his grade. I think he was even better as far as win percentage. He was eighth. So I'm good with that. But then in run defense, he ranked 60th, which unfortunately was the highest graded defensive tackle on this entire team, which is a big part of the reason why our run defense was so poor. Jaron Reed, by the way, ranked 69th. He ranked below Kenny Clark and Tyler Lancaster, who was 62nd, which is part of the reason why I'm not massive. Um, overly excited. Dean Lowry was 73rd, just behind Jaron. So they're all right in that cluster. So all that to say, I'm not trying to trash Kenny Clark, but all that to say, I don't think it's a Joe Barry thing. I'm hopeful that maybe a year two of Joe Barry's scheme, it'll get better. Maybe by bringing in other guys that can help him. I, I, I'm absolutely not lost on the reality that when Mike Daniels left, it really hurt Kenny Clark. And that a big part of his success was probably the fact that Mike Daniels was a freak, and there has not been a freak next to Kenny Clark since he left. And despite all the claims that Jaron Reed is the most talented guy we've had along the defensive line since uh, Mike Daniels, which I find to be pure trash, I do think we need to find that guy. Whether Jaron Reed ends up being the next Devondre Campbell, who suddenly figures it out and becomes an elite, whether it's TJ Slay whether it's Devontae Wyatt, I don't know, but we need that guy. Because I, I do think that's going to help massively. And I'd love to see that 90 overall Kenny Clark. But I don't think it's a Joe Barry thing. And again, this is maybe his best pass rush year of his entire career this past year. So, uh, hopeful. I'm hopeful. Hello, Packernet Podcast. This is Tom Sawson coming Hi. from the hospital. What up? Um, Repping it. If the NFL and Dunder Mifflin <laughs> came together and you had to make a, a character from the office be the head coach, a different character be the offensive coordinator, and a different character be the defensive coordinator. Who would you choose and why? Thank you. Have a great night. Bye. My memory is so bad, but I feel like I've answered this already, but I don't remember, so we're going to pretend I didn't. Um, I know there was a similar question somewhere out there. Head coach, offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator. Michael Scott's not getting any job. Um, who's in contention for head coach? Ryan did go to business school. Jim, because, I don't know, he's one of the few competent people on the show. Oscar's a very smart numbers guy. Jan had a prominent role in the company. Robert California was CEO. He's insane, but that's, you know, it's the office. Uh, Nelly got stuff done, right? Just kind of seems to find a way, which is important if you're the head. David Wallace, Joe Bennett, similar, you know, high ups and whatnot. Josh Porter, he did take that job with Staples, but maybe he'd come over. 
Charles Minor, I don't know. I don't know what that would do for morale. He is pretty intense. Danny Cordray, good sales. Uh, Holly's boyfriend can go stick it. He's not getting any job with me. Todd Packer. I mean, he'd, he'd feel like he'd be a good locker room guy. You know? I know it doesn't work well in an office, but I you know, might work in a locker room. He Day. Can't really understand He Day, but he's a surgeon, so he's smart. He also killed him. So that's pretty intense. Technically, Warren Buffett was on the show. He might be someone to consider. How about this? Jim's the OC. Daryl's the defensive coordinator. Just because they're sports guys and like them. And the head coach will do uh, will do David Wallace. Just because those two guys like David Wallace, they get along. No tension. He's intelligent. He's not very motivating, but, you know, there's not a lot of motivating characters on that show, I don't think. Maybe Robert California, but that could go south really fast creeping people out and whatnot. All right, let's see how this works. Uh, I have a bad feeling about this because Google's like, I don't know, I picked up five words, and it's caller number five, so we'll see how it goes. Oh, hello, Ryan. This is caller number five. Leave your voicemail. This is just an impression of the piss-off jaggers. <laughs> I was wondering what would break us. Sammy Watkins or JJ's will to listen. <laughs> anyway, I don't know if I actually have a question. What, what are you? How about t- this? What are you talking into? It's like uh, it's like when you're a kid and you talk into a cup and you're like, "Mom, listen," and then you're just like, <laughs> you know. Anyways, I can't make out hardly anything you're saying. Do you think the defense will be ready week one without playing their starters? Everyone talks about the offense, but no one talks about the defense. I'll thank you in advance for all the podcasts you're going to make this year. We will need them. All right. Take it easy. I'm going to have to listen to this one a couple times to find out what the heck he said. But it's the last call, so I got to get it. So let's see. Let's see if we can figure this one out. All right. Do you think the defense will be ready week one without playing any other starters? Last year, week one, which I know was a travesty, but let's just get some of the numbers down. Five players had 70 or higher overall grades, with one of them, Preston, being in the 80s. In fact, Stokes was almost an 80 also week one. So half the team was 60 or higher, a little more than that. 12 of 21. Five players were 70 or higher. 17 of 21 were 50 or higher. Week two, five players were 70 or higher. 12 were 60 and higher, exact same. 16 were 50 or higher. If we look at, for example, week 16, four players, 70 or higher. Seven players, 60 or higher. So that was a bad week, worse than week one. Week 15, four players, 70 or higher. 11 players, 60 or higher. So again, almost identical. Week 14 was significantly better. So, I mean, there's better there's better games, and, and more so toward the end of the season, that's true. But he, he, let's see when their first, like, really good game was, just out of curiosity. It wasn't week three. Uh, it wasn't week four was not week five. It was not week six. They still had they had six guys 70 or higher, 11 still at 60 or higher. So it's almost identical every single week. Their first maybe really good game was week seven, kind of, but not really because there were just as many bad, if not even more bad. The only benefit was there were eight guys at 70 or higher, but only two additional, 10, were 60 or higher, which is lower than usual. So I'm not even going to count week seven. Week eight, do do do. Week eight was bad. Week nine was bad. Only two players, seventy or higher. Week ten, week ten. Here we go. Week ten was their first really good defensive performance based on grades. Two guys at ninety or above: Kevin King and Adrian Amos. So there you go. Eight at seven. Actually, you know what? Nine. Devondre Campbell was sixty-nine point nine. We're gonna go ahead and round that up. So. Campbell, Slayton, Savage, Whitney Merciless, Eric Stokes, Preston Smith, Rashawn Gary, Kevin King, Adrian Amos. All of them were good in this game. And 14 were 60 and higher. 
Only one to only five were below a 60. Nobody was below 50. The lowest was Razul Douglas, 51.1. That was the game against the Seattle Seahawks. That was week 10, before there was any real noticeable uptick in the quality of the defense. So do I think that playing one quarter for our starters is going to make a difference? No. Week one didn't help week two. Week ones and two didn't... Week one, two, three, four, five, six, seven didn't help week eight. It takes time for everything to click. It's not going to be week one. It's not going to be... And, and that's the thing. The team that they are at the end of the season should be better, minus the injuries and whatnot. But it's a culmination of weeks and weeks and weeks and, in fact, months. So the idea that week one they're going to come out and just crush it because they played one quarter, I don't buy it. And again, you say, well, it's not about crushing it. It's about they're going to be super horrible because they haven't even seen the field yet. I, I don't buy that either. First of all, they've had training camp. They've been going after it. So so the 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 culmination of what they would get in a quarter, they've already got more than that through training camp. But again, we just looked at week one. It wasn't significant. It, it wasn't at all worse than some of the other games that we saw. I know the score was bad. But I, again, if you look at the individual players, it's not like everybody came out and was horrible. Preston Smith was the highest graded player. Why? Week one was Preston Smith's third best game of the entire season. Jair didn't play very much, but he had a great game week one. He did not have a great game week two, and then another good game week three, and then not another good game week four. It was 50-50 down the street. But again, no noticeable difference at week one. And even if you look at the, the bad players, Kingsley Kiki, well, Kingsley Kiki did play in the preseason, so that doesn't work. Jonathan Garvin had by far his worst game of the season week one. Guess what? He played 100 snaps in the preseason, so what's his excuse? Kevin King, real bad day week one. He had an even worse day week 11, though. Why? Also weeks 2 and 15, Chauncey River. First of all, yes, he played in the preseason. Second of all, he's had worse games. I mean, it was almost identical game week three, just two weeks later. Dean Lowry had a 52 overall grade. Two weeks later, he had a 44 overall. Weeks 10, 11, 12, 55, 54, and 30. So it wasn't by any stretch his worst game. Chris Barnes had a 53 overall grade. He did play in the preseason. Also had a 28 overall grade week six, 51 week seven, 29 week eight, 44 week 11, 30 week 16, 32 week 18. Tyler Lancaster, 54. The next week, 46. Two weeks later, 30. Then 54. Then 45. Then 55. Then 41. That was basically every week for the first nine weeks. And then he got better. 66, 76, 75, 62, 80. Something clicked for him. Week 10. So, you know, are they going to be ready? No. Are they going to be ready if they play a, you know, a half a quarter or a couple drives in the first quarter? No. They're not going to be ready. They're not going to be ready after week one, but they'll you know, probably be about as ready as the guys across from him on the other side of the field. So I just, I don't worry about it, man. You know, I, I, I know there's a general concern about coming out flat, um, but I have that concern in the playoffs too. I have that concern week nine, you know, when, when kickoff happens and you're all excited and then the, the team goes out there and it's like, I, I it, it just dawns on me in that moment. I don't know what we're about to see. All the hype and all the analysis about how our team's better and look at our wide receivers, but you never know who's going to show up today. You never know what's going to happen. And suddenly, you know, you go up against a team that you should absolutely wipe off the map, and the offense goes three and out, and then you punt, and they shank the punt, and all of a sudden the other team starts on like the 49-yard line, and you're suddenly you realize, oh, crap. Maybe all that talk over the week meant nothing. And suddenly everything's falling apart, and I don't know why, because on paper we should be better, but this isn't on paper. These are human beings, and sometimes they aren't at their best. And I think we attribute way too much to week one last year being because, you know, like 10 guys didn't play a quarter. Sometimes a team loses. Sometimes a team loses by a lot. In fact, if you look at times the Packers have lost by 20, it's happened pretty much once a year, every year since 2012. Sometimes multiple times, but uh, did it to the Saints. We lost. Oh, come on. We lost by uh, 35. We lost by 28 against Tampa. That was week six. The year before that was San Francisco, week 12. The year before that was Detroit. 2017, it happened to us against Detroit, Baltimore, and Atlanta. Um, Obviously, this is 
prior to Matt LaFleur's tenure here, but still, it's just, it's a thing that happens at uh, various times, and it happened to happen week one, and I think we're just attributing way too much of that to sitting starters. I I, I don't know that we can 100% draw that parallel line there. But anyways, um, that's my answer. I'm going to get out of here. You guys have yourselves a great night, and I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.